Hello, and welcome to Semantic Reactions, the official podcast of the Institute of General Semantics. My name is Ben Houck, and I'm pleased to be able to introduce the ninth episode in our ongoing series. For our May 2023 podcast, Lance Strait interviews author and IGS past president Martin Levinson. Their conversation covers Levinson's background in general semantics, his career in education, and his writing, centering on his satirical work. Levinson shares a reading from his latest book, Lunch with the American People, Satirical Food for Thought. Let's hear what they have to say. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Semantic Reactions. I'm Lance Strait, and I'm here with Marty Levinson. Uh, We're particularly going to talk about his, uh, his recently published book, Lunch with the American People, Satirical Food for Thought. But let me also mention that Marty is the author of a number of books that we'll also talk about. And uh, the past president, the immediate past president of the Institute of General Semantics. So welcome, Marty. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Well, it's great to have you on. And before we get to your current book, uh, I think uh, it would be interesting to hear uh, as someone who is devoted a lot of time, effort, energy to general semantics, how you first got into and learned about and got interested in the discipline of general semantics. Well, this is a story I've related many times to those who are in the field who know it, but thank you for asking it. Hopefully, uh, it'll reinforce that story with those who know it and maybe introduce the story to those who don't know it. But in any event, it was uh, 1978 or 79. I was living in Greenwich Village, going to NYU, uh, completing a uh, doctorate in educational administration. And uh, for kicks, I took a continuing education course at Cooper Union, which is located not far from NYU, not far from where I was living. And uh, the course was entitled, How to Improve Your Thinking and Communicating Ability. And I thought, I can always use that. Plus, I was a counselor at the time in a, in a middle school, junior high school is what they called it back then. And I thought, um, well, maybe I can pick up some ideas to get across to the students I'm counseling because their thinking and communicating ability wasn't all that good, particularly the ones I was counseling. They were the ones in trouble in school. And so um, I went to the first session of the course, was taught by a fellow by the name of Harry Maynard. Turned out he was a vice president in charge of marketing for Time Life when Life magazine was publishing back then. That was a big job. He was a wonderful teacher, just really enthusiastic and knew a lot of stuff. And he started off um, talking about what I later would learn with general semantics concepts, uh, uh, dating and indexing. And he assigned the book uh, that we were to uh, use for the course, People in Quandaries by Wendell Johnson, which is a book I know you're familiar with and many folks who studied general semantics back in the 80s and 90s, I guess we're using in formal university courses. And uh, I got the book and I, uh, after a couple of sessions, I was hooked. I thought, wow, this is great stuff. I was thinking in general semantics ways even before that, but there were labels for it. And I thought, gee, you know, I'm thinking, and I was also learning new, new ideas, but I thought, wow, this is terrific stuff. And I thought it was so good. As I said, I was taking a, uh, I was involved in the doctoral program at NYU in educational administration. But I thought, gee, I'd love to do something with general semantics for my PhD. And uh, in any event, uh, what happened is I went to my advisor. I said, you know, I'm going to be doing a controlled study of my students, an experimental study. And uh, I'd like to use general semantics in that study. And he said, you know, I don't know much about general semantics, really nothing but no one's ever done an experimental study in our department. And I think it would be great to have you be the first. And if you can find someone here at NYU, you know, a professor or a teacher who knows, uh, who's an expert in the area, um, I probably would let you do it. And of course, Neil Postman was teaching at NYU and he's an expert in the area. And Neil very kindly acceded to my request to be on my committee and although I've never taken a class with Neil and have all his books now, and I just meeting with him was such a delight. He was such a 
a learned man, but so easy to talk to. Anyway, that's how I got involved with general semantics. Okay, and and you mentioned NYU, which for our listeners who are not familiar with that, the abbreviation uh, is New York University. Um, and uh, I believe uh, Abraham Lincoln once spoke at Cooper Union. Uh, so we have another American connection there. Um, I was wondering then, uh, so you, uh, you were mentored by Neil Postman, but independently of the Media Ecology Program. Uh, I was wondering if you had any uh, further memories or impressions of Neil Postman. This was around, this was in the late 70s. So he had Early published, yes, yeah, yeah, so he had published yeah, Crazy right. Talk, Stupid Talk in 76, yeah. which was his, uh, it was his major kind of general semantics oriented work. Uh, so, uh, you know, what do you recall about Postman? Only good. <laughs> um, <laughs> I recall his sense of humor. I mean, the other two uh, professors on my committee were nice fellows, but um, you couldn't joke around with them. Uh, I wouldn't even, I tried once or twice, and I, I saw them not good looks on their face, so I said, all right, we'll keep this serious. But Neil was obviously a, a well-respected academic, but also a wonderful sense of humor, but also uh, a very practical fellow. You know, I always look at people in academia, certain brilliant people, um, and knew a lot about subjects, but you know, the absent-minded professor, the stereotype, uh, not all that practical. You know, it seemed to me unbelievably practical, and here's how he held me in a wonderfully practical way, saved me a lot of time. So as you know, and people know, I guess today they may still do that, to, uh, to qualify for the PhD, you had to have two tools, is what they called them back then, uh, outside of your you know, main subject area. And typically the tools were uh, statistics in a foreign language. That's what uh, most people use as tools to qualify for the PhD. So I was going to do a uh, experimental study. So statistics seemed to me to be something I would have taken anyway without having to have a tool because I was going to run statistical analyses using the mainframe computer in the Bob's library in the basement. This was, a, I mean, today we were all on these little, little laptops. Back then the computer was, took up the whole basement almost. It had punch cards and you fed them into this machine and they would read it. So I, I knew I needed statistics. But I thought taking a foreign language was a total waste of time. I mean, it's a good idea to learn a foreign language, I guess. Uh, but for my research, I wasn't going to read anything other than in English. So this seemed to be an academic hoop that was just, uh, you do it for form, but it didn't really have any substance. So I said to Neil, you know, I'm in this program and you know I need two tools. And uh, I'm really sad about having to take the foreign language. He said, well, how about thinking about general semantics as a tool? I said, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. <laughs> he said, yeah, you know, not exactly a foreign language, but I mean, it is, it uses its own terms. It has its own jargon, separate field. Um, I would, if you would want to do that, I would prove that if you could get the other two uh, professors on the committee to, uh, to do that. So I went to uh, the chair of my committee, who was Neil, who was a fellow in the uh, administration department, Lloyd Bishop. I said, you know, uh, Professor Postman said I could possibly use general semantics as a tool. Uh, I think it's a good idea. It would be practical for me to get into general semantics more. And um, I would like to do that in lieu of a foreign language. Do you think you and... Uh, the other, I forget the guy's name, or Cy Evans, the other per, the other professor would, would allow me to do that. He said, well, you could talk to Cy, but I, if Professor Postman thinks that, uh, that you could do it, then uh, I would go along with it. And uh, Professor Evans also thought it was a good idea, so I went to uh, Neil and I said, well, uh, it's approved. Uh, the question I have for you is, uh, obviously, I'll have to demonstrate to your satisfaction that I know general semantics, um, how would I do that? Uh, mm -hmm. Would you give me a test? He said, no, Marty, what we'll do is you make up a test. You make up a test as if you were the professor and you were testing someone's knowledge of general semantics. And I thought, what a brilliant idea. I would have never thunk it, as we say in Brooklyn. 
And um, I made up that test. And um, it was a, as I recall, it was, I think it was a 50 question multiple choice with essays test. And it took me a long, long time to make up the test. And I really had to go back and review the concepts and formulations of general semantics. It's a wonderful way to learn it. Actually, I, I did such a good job that that test was later published in the General Semantics Bulletin <laughs> on its own. So I got a publication credit. Who knew? But anyway, uh, that, that was Neil's idea. And um, I just loved going to the office when I could. I mean, he wasn't a chairperson, so I didn't see him that often. But, um, you know, talking to him and learning a little bit about media ecology, and it was one of my great regrets in life that I never took a class at NYU with Neil. But I have all his books. They're on my bookshelf, the hard copies, and a great writer. I listened to him when he was on sunrise semester in the morning. Oh, I would get up at 6.30 and 7 and listen to God. him. And I love that that idea of, of the test. And it really goes back to it's a point that Postman made and others like McLuhan that uh, questions are much more important than answers. You know, if you can think of the questions, then the answers will come rather easily. But the questions are the hard part, especially good questions. And, and of course, Neil always uh, stressed uh, asking good questions because he thought that that idea that that uh, we kind of are taught as kids that there's no such thing as a bad question was was an example of stupid talk <laughs> that uh, of course there are there are bad questions and then there are questions that are very good and and he certainly tried to ask good questions himself yeah i i agree and he also that was one of the things about general semantics also harry maynard the person who was teaching the course mentioned that you know mm -hmm. the, the importance of questions and so, um, and that was something I really hadn't considered. So that was, uh, that was, that was good for me to hear. And uh, I try to practice that, you know, in the rest of my life. I don't think they're always, always good, but I certainly think about it. Yeah. And, and it also relates to tools because questions, and, and, and this is also something Christine Nystrom uh, kind of conveyed to us that method, you know, this whole thing about methodology and, and you think about statistics and formulas and all of that, um, but that it really boils down to asking a certain set of questions, that that's what a tool or method is fundamentally doing. And the rest is just a kind of structure built around that question. Yeah, no, that makes total sense to me. Uh, I heard someone say there's nothing more practical than a good theory. Uh, George uh, Gordon used to say that when I was started out at Fordham. George Gordon, who was Terry Moran's mentor, be, uh, along with Neil, uh, always used to say that. Uh, I remember that. And when I went off to class, he would say, beat back the barriers of ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> Bring that back now. Uh, that's great. I mean, yeah. yeah which, which, yeah. No, I, I think that's wonderful. Yeah, sure. Yeah, which, which gets us to your career in education. So your PhD was in educational administration. Yeah. And you had a career with the New York City Board of Education. Do you want to tell us something about that? Sure. Well, it was an interesting, uh, well, it's interesting to me, maybe to some of the listeners, too, about how I got into that career. So uh, when I graduated college, this was during the Vietnam War. Some of you who are a little bit younger, uh, I mean, I'm sure you've heard of the Vietnam War, but those of us who lived during that era who were of college age uh, and, didn't really, and didn't support the war and thought the war was kind of stupid and uh, dangerous and didn't want to be drafted because there was a draft during that time. Um, were in college and that was a deferment from being drafted. Uh, but afterwards, uh, so anyway, I didn't know what I wanted to do after. I, I had political science major in college. I like political science, I like politics. But I really didn't know what I wanted to do after I graduated college. But I knew I didn't want to go into the uh, service. So I decided to go to law school. I thought, well, okay, law school's good. You know, uh, it would give me three more years of deferment. I didn't have, wouldn't have to run to Canada, where many, where many people were doing, not many, but some were doing in the 60s. I wasn't going to burn my draft card. And had I been drafted, I would have, uh, I was almost drafted. But anyway, um, so what I decided to do was go to law school. And I um, wound up at UCLA Law School, 
That's another story. I was from Brooklyn and uh, wow. in California was the, was the golden land. I mean, you know, sunshine. I, I actually, I applied to three law schools on the West Coast. I didn't care which one accepted me. And they were really pretty good law schools. Uh, but anyway, I got into UCLA and I was like I was in heaven. I, it was sunny and Christmas and, uh, you know, I was in New York, warm. Uh, but in any event, after my year of law school, uh, they took the deferment away. They said only one year of law school. So, uh, so to not be drafted, I went back to well, I went back to New York for the summer. And apparently, uh, if you were teaching in a uh, tough neighborhood, you could still avert the draft. So that's how that's how I started teaching. I never thought I would be a teacher. I had ten credits of education credits, I think, in college. And I only took them because they were easy courses, so I figured I could get an A and boost my index. And um, anyway, I wound up, there was a teacher strike in New York back in uh, 67, 68 in Ocean Hill Brownsville. It was I remember that Central. well. I was, I was supposed to start seventh grade that year. <laughs> well, you, I could start have been to, teaching. Well, yeah. Start junior <laughs> high, yeah. There you go. So uh, anyway... Um, I really didn't know much about it. I just come back from California and they, they needed teachers because the teachers were striking. And so I went down to the central board and you had to take a test to become a teacher. And I took the test and uh, passed the test and they made me a teacher. Uh, and I, was, I wound up teaching junior high school science and the amount of science background I had was high school chemistry. Uh, but it really didn't matter because uh, in the school I was teaching, it was in Ocean Hill Brownsville. It was uh, a, a sort of an impoverished part of the city. That was the only district that was open because they were decentralized. And so this particular school, I remember, is IS-271. Every day there'd be teaching teachers demonstrating against scabs. And I, apparently I was one of the scabs. And there'd be hundreds of police keeping the teachers and the strike breakers and the community who was for decentralization away from each other. And in the school, we would have television crews filming. So very little teaching was being done. So it didn't matter what I knew, I could hardly teach at all. But I, I really did try to teach the science. You know, I, I learned the stuff and I, these, you know, I, I was one step ahead of the students, but they were so, so dazed by what was going on. Anyway, so that was the start. And anyway, I found I loved teaching. I loved being with the students. I loved trying to get information across. And um, so I went back the following year, uh, taught elementary school. My license was elementary school. There again, I was learning as I was doing it. I really didn't deserve the license, but I had it. And um, you know, I was bright enough to pick up the, uh, and I was a pretty good teacher. I got great reviews, the students liked me, the principals gave me good reviews. And from then on, I, uh, I went on to a drug prevention program where teachers could do that. I eventually became, for administration, the director of the drug prevention program in Queens. And uh, I had a 35 year career with the, uh, they now call it the Department of Education, not the Board of Education. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> yeah. well, Bloomberg came in with bit more business. I could tell you stories about how we killed the, the system back in the early 2000s, but uh, but you know that's it for a different podcast. But in any event, um, so that was a career, and um, and, I, and I, as I say, I just really lucked out into that career. So, uh, so that was it. That was that. Well, so it was elementary school because I it, my memories of junior high school. Um, I think that might have you might have uh, we went through several teachers in one year. Uh, who were avoiding the draft and, and I guess decided that they'd rather face the Viet Cong than us. <laughs> but, you know, the, yeah. <laughs> uh, just as a side story, just interesting, uh, that I think it's interesting. Uh, so, you know, in the military, you're allowed to retire. I think you have to 20 years and get a pension. So I read somewhere that some of these uh, retirees from the military, they're in their 40s, they were looking around to do something else. So they wound up you know, teaching, going into teaching, and they couldn't last because in the military, when you give an order, it's followed. But in teaching, when you give an order, the kids would say, eh, forget about it. Who are you? <laughs> and they couldn't take it. <laughs> 
So you mentioned the drug prevention, and I know that's, is that your first book, uh, first big publication with in general semantics? Uh, what happened uh, is uh, after I got my PhD, that's another interesting thing. My wife also uh, has a PhD and she was uh, teaching uh, college uh, when I finished. Uh, no, after I finished, she got hers after I finished mine. And she wound up as a uh, teaching at Colgate University and uh, she was teaching there and she published a book. And I said, gee, she published a book. I'm going to publish a book. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And also, I was visiting her at the university. They had a wonderful library at Colgate, and so did NYU. But I was, we had a commuter marriage back in the 90s. I was worth the city. She was upstate in Colgate. So I spent a lot of time visiting her, and I had a lot of spare time. And I'd be in the library, and I could do research on this book. Uh, and I thought I'd write a book on something I would knew, something I knew, which would be, you know, drug uh, prevention. That was my field. And I knew general semantics, so I combined the two. And... Uh, Fortunately, was able to get a publisher, Greenwood Press. And yes, that was my first uh, book on general semantics. And then how did you get involved in leadership in uh, general semantics? Because, uh, you know, we talked, got your time on the, with, with uh, board, the Board of Ed, Department of Education in New York, but you also got involved with uh, the Institute and, uh, you know, ultimately became president of the Institute, but how did you first get on the board of trustees? Well, after I uh, got my PhD, I uh, published a few things. I published my, this is an article about my dissertation was published in the General Semantics Bulletin. And um, the New York Society of General Semantics uh, was, it still is active, but it was very active back in the 80s. And I joined the New York Society of General Semantics. I would go down to monthly meetings. And uh, in the 90s, I got a call from uh, Jeffrey Mortkowitz, who was the president of the Institute of General Semantics. And he invited me onto the board. I guess uh, I met him a few times at the uh, New York Society meetings. And uh, I guess he thought I had something to contribute. So I joined the board. And... Um, at the time, the Institute was located, I think, in New Jersey. That was where they were, for a time in Brooklyn also. And then all of a sudden, uh, this fellow, Steve Stockdale, came, who was from uh, Texas, he came on, and he convinced board members, this was before I was on the board, uh, to move, uh, to have a physical, a big physical location. When it was in New Jersey and in Brooklyn, there really wasn't a, a building. They, they, they operated out of their house or an office or a small office somewhere, but he wanted to build a uh, or have a operate out of a big building and have a real institute uh, in, in a building. And so uh, when I got on the board, um, the institute was in Texas, in Fort Worth, Texas, in a, a large building in a suburb of Fort Worth. And um, I thought it was a poor idea because, of, first of all, the building was expensive. And it wasn't even in a downtown area. It was in a suburb where you wouldn't get foot traffic even. Um, but but then what really uh, I thought was a bad idea was Steve, I think, tried very hard to make a go of the Institute. I mean, he really worked hard. But after a few years, I think he saw that um, he really couldn't grow it. And um, he was teaching part-time for the college down there, Texas Christian University. And he thought, uh, he, he made a, a pitch to the board that since we weren't really doing so well uh, as an independent entity, that we should be subsumed by Texas Christian University, that they would take it over. He would go there and run it out of Texas Christian University. And um, I thought that was a terrible idea. And so did many on our board. Uh, and basically, we went back and forth with him on that, and I won't get into the politics of it. That this could be a separate book. But in any event, uh, what happened is he uh, quit. He resigned. And um, the people on the board turned to me because I was one of the more vocal ones that was basically telling Steve it was a bad idea. And they said, uh, Marty, uh, you, you, you take over uh, doing this. Uh, you know, Now, Steve was an executive director. There was this board with the president, but uh, 
I, fortunately at the time, I think I was retired. I don't know if I would have done this. So I, this was a lot of work, but I had been, I retired from the New York City job as a, you know, head of the drug prevention program in 2004. And so when I came on, uh, I had the time to actually do the work of a director, not just a board president, which is a more of a governing kind of thing, but more of as a director, which is a, I was a director of a drug prevention program. That's a, that's a job where you have day-to-day -day responsibility on keeping the organization running. You're not just a governance, which is an important job, but overseeing policy. You're doing the day-to-day, -day, you know, writing letters or making sure they go out, paying bills, signing checks, I mean, doing the day-to-day -day stuff. So I came on and, um, and uh, took over the presidency. And then, of course, you remember, you were for a while executive director, you did a great job doing that. And then we decided because of financial reasons, we really couldn't have a director. It would have to be an all-voluntary organization. But I stayed on as the president for, uh, I guess, 12 or 13 years. And it, as we know now, the president really is a director too. Because we're all volunteer, we're all volunteers, and uh, to keep the thing going, you really have to uh, do more than just be governance. It has to be operational. So we're very fortunate now that you stepped in to take on the presidency and, and the day-to-day -day operations of the board. But but that's how I got involved. Well, thank you. And uh, in that period of time, you also published several books on general semantics. Uh, do you want to? Tell us a bit about uh, your sensible thinking and fairy tale pursuits. Yes, thank you. Yeah, well, I've always, uh, one of the nice things about general semantics for me is unlike a number of the folks on the board who are um, academics who have you know, full-time jobs in academia, uh, I've always loved uh, academia and academics, but my full-time gig was uh, in the Board of Education. And, you know, we had, there were some people with PhDs in the Board of Ed, but not many. It's a basically a different kind of work. Uh, but I always, uh, I mean, I, I always did adjunct work, even when I was working at the board. I would put in the full day at the board, and then I would, at night I would teach the various colleges. I think in New York, I taught at St. John's, at NYU, at Delphi, at a place I remember, the Laboratory Institute of Merchandising. Uh, just Medgar Evers. I was just running around all over the place because I loved college teaching so much that I wanted to keep my hand in it. And I love writing. And so uh, what was wonderful for me about general semantics was that uh, there was a journal, et cetera, and I could write for that journal. I could have articles published so I could actually do research um, and I, you know, as, as a non-academic, I really didn't have too much access to uh, other academic publications where I could get my uh, writing published, but had et cetera. So I, you know, wrote many, many different articles using general semantics in different areas. And I had so many articles, I wound up uh, putting, uh, putting a collection. This is fairly common, I guess, in academia. You put a collection of articles together and in a, in a certain way, in a structured way, and you have a book. Mm -hmm. So uh, I had two books, uh, Sensible Thinking for Turbulent Times and More Sensible Thinking. And I, the, 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 originally I published those, uh, one of them I published myself, and then the Institute uh, thankfully published uh, as an Institute publication. But both those books were published by the Institute. And then um, I had this idea, uh, I've always enjoyed writing, of uh, seeing um, Jeremy Klein, who was a uh, very active with Etc., uh, an editor of Etc. for a while, um, did a series on general semantics mysteries, mystery stories. Mm -hmm. And I got a kick out of those mystery stories. I thought, what a wonderful way to teach people general semantics, not just you know through lectures or through essays, but through, uh, through mysteries, through fantasy. So I thought, gee, wouldn't it be fun to teach them through fairy tales, sort of like fractured fairy tales. If, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's not straight fairy tales, but like Rocky and Bullwinkle. some of you who know Rocky and Bullwinkle, a fractured fairy tale. So I uh, came up with a bunch of fairy tales and uh, that I could, some regular fairy tales, some I made up, but some I took, you know, Three Little Pigs, and I twisted them to have a general semantics um, moral. 
And so I put some together and uh, came out with this book, Practical Fairy Tales for Everyday Living. Um, and um, people seem to like it. But what I really got a kick out of um, is uh, at one of the conferences, it's a professor in Italian. Um, yeah. He came up to me at a conference and said, oh, I love this book so much. I'm going to have my students translate it into Italian. It's so good. And he sent me the copy. And I thought, wow, that's wonderful. And then uh, we were, were affiliated with the um, with the with the Balvat Perex Center in India, mm -hmm. and they translated into the, into the, uh, Gujarati. And uh, since then, the institutes uh, paid for translations have been translated into uh, French, Spanish, Hebrew, and uh, in the next couple of weeks, it'll be it'll come out in Arabic. So we're doing more for the Middle East between Hebrew and Arabic than uh, most of the people that are trying to get Israel and uh, the Arab countries together. If they would, if they could get together over general semantics, wouldn't that be great? But anyway, that's been fun. Well, you know, and you mentioned humor. You mentioned uh, the fairy tales, and uh, of course, uh, Jeremy Klein was editor while et cetera was. Uh, which had been launched by the Society for General Semantics and then the turned into the International Society for General Semantics. And uh, I also think of the late Paul Denethor Johnston, who also wrote humor based for et cetera and grounded in general semantics. Um, and I'm, well, let, let me just say about Paul, because I, I neglected sure. to mention this. Uh, if, if any of you, uh, and um, please do get practical fairy tales for everyday living. Get the hard copy. Don't don't get the Kindle. Uh, that book is illustrated, and those are Paul's illustrations. He was kind enough to provide the illustrations, and they're terrific. So he was a one. He, he was a, a multi talented guy. Yes, and 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 a humorist, and and so yes. uh, and and it occurs to me that you also mentioned political science. Uh, you know, early interest in that, and. Uh, and that brings us to your satire writing. So uh, how did you get into or how did you first start writing satire? And, uh, you know, what prompted you to do that and then to come out with this book? That's a good question. Uh, so, um, I've, as I say, I've always enjoyed writing and I did mostly academic writing, you know, essay writing, I could publish and et cetera. Uh, because, um, Unlike many people, I like, well, I think, I'm not, I shouldn't generalize, but when I write something, I like to see it published. Uh, many, many people, I can't say that because these people I know write just for the joy of writing, which I think is wonderful. Uh, and don't care if it's published or not. Uh, but for whatever reason, I like to see stuff published. Uh, which is part of the reason I wrote, oh, I wrote a book uh, that would the Institute published on poetry. A similar reactions, and it, and it, like, why would I get into poetry? Well, one of the things, very practical, is um, I thought, what are the odds of publishing a poem compared to publishing, say, a short story? Wonderful, because there were so many poetry journals out there that although it is hard to get a poem published, it's a lot easier to get a poem published than a short story. And I like writing uh, sort of fanciful things, so I put together poems. So, by the way, that's another interesting book, Signal Reaction. So I'll put in a plug for that one. The Institute yeah, so kindly what, published that. Yeah, and actually, look, why don't we first talk about that? Because uh, so you started writing poetry. Um, it was eventually collected in Signal Reactions, um, which the IGS publishes under our new series of uh, Language in Action. And uh, that ha it, it's uh, the poetry in there is also uh, coupled with some very beautiful uh, images. Do you want to say anything about that? Yeah, yeah. Just like uh, I have to thank Paul for the illustrations for uh, Practical Fairy Tales. I have to thank uh, my wife, who's a uh, professional photographer. Uh, for the photographs that go with the poems. I think there are 50 poems in there and there are 50 photographs. And uh, I mean, the photographs are as good or better than the poetry. I mean, they are really, really good. 
And that, again, that's a book you really don't want to get on Kindle. That's a book you want to own for the photographs alone. But the poems, are, well, they're not bad. They've all been published in other places before I put them together. So they were all at least worthy enough that some other person or persons decided they could go somewhere else besides uh, my desk drawer. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, <laughs> But so, but, but that was, so that was, it. so it, so anyway, um, I like to learn new things. And so, uh, so I got involved with poetry and that was interesting for a while. And then uh, I thought, gee, as you say, I've always been, uh, I was a political science major. I've always followed politics. I've always uh, tried to not be directly involved, although I contribute, you know, money to political causes and candidates. Uh, but I, uh, I'm interested in it, and uh, I'm also, and also uh, in terms of sense of humor, I've been told I have a okay sense of humor, fairly good sense of humor since childhood. I've, I've always enjoyed uh, joking around, things like that. Um, but the nice part about satire, what, what I like about satire, I've always liked about satire, is you can use humor, but you sort of use humor not just for comedy sense, which is fine. I mean, nothing wrong with a joke for the sake of a joke. Uh, people make good livings <laughs> doing that. Uh, but also, uh, the nice part about satire is um, you get the, the joke, or it doesn't have to. Be, satire doesn't have to be, by the way, humorous, but it, it can be, and it often is. But it also comes along with a critique. You know, you're you're critiquing something. And um, I found that one of the ways I've been able to stay sane in the world, um, relatively sane, at least that's, I think I am, but who knows. But anyway, <laughs> one of the ways I found I be relatively sane is to try not to be so emotionally distraught when things in the world don't go the way I think they ought to go or the way I think not just the way I think, but the way I think morally they, they ought to go. You know? and, and so I, I notice people get really upset about stuff. And my wife sometimes will argue with the television. Oh, can you believe he said that? And of course I can believe he said that. And, uh, but, but she gets really emotionally involved with it, which can be good, I think, particularly if you channel it. I mean, it's not bad to get angry, if you channel it in some way, you know, you're really angry about an injustice and it causes you to either contribute money or do something, start a movement or become part of a movement, that's good. But so often people just become angry and they're frustrated inside and their mood becomes bleak. Uh, so it doesn't do them any good. It doesn't do anybody any good. But what I like about satire is you take some of that emotion that you feel toward towards something being wrong and you can channel it into a creative activity. You know, it challenges you and you can get the idea out there and then maybe people can talk about it. And um, so anyway, I started writing satires. I'm a part of a writer's group. Uh, I've always been part of a writer's group. Now I'm living on the Eastern end of Long Island. I'm part of a writer's group. And I started, um, you know, writing some to them. And then I found this, uh, this journal called The Satirist, an online journal. And I started submitting uh, satires I write to them, and they they were publishing them. And uh, I just was I just so enjoy writing satires because, um, as I say, you can you you can you you can sublimate your feelings of anger or distress uh, to something where you don't have to feel so bad inside, and you can feel like you're doing some good and that you're sharing your message with others who can talk about it. I certainly don't think satire is changing anything. I mean, when I write a satire against something, I don't think that, wow, they're going to read my satire and change it. Certainly the people you're targeting or the ideas you're targeting, they're not going to change because you're attacking them. And the people that you are, um, who are supporting you support you anyway. Uh, but I think... You didn't ask this, but what I think satire does do, it, it sort of buoys the morale of others. And that, oh, I feel the same way. Or, or it sort of lowers their emotional temperature so they don't feel so bad. Oh, that's, that's funny. That's interesting. That's a nice way to look at it. 
And also in the boys, the morale, they may then give more money to a cause or they may join a group. They may, you know, instead of being so insular, they may become more uh, extrinsic and do something with it. So, uh, so anyway, that's how I got involved. And I, I put together 50 of these satires that I had that already published in the satirist into a book. And uh, as I said, it was published in this series that you are the, uh, the, uh, the editor of this new series on, on different works, not just academic works. And I was fortunate enough that the Institute decided to publish it. And, and that idea of uh, social, ethical, moral uh, criticism via satire, um, sometimes referred to as manipian satire, which is something that uh, a certain group of McLuhan folks are, uh, talk about a lot. Um, and uh, uh, But uh, as far as the publishing of the book, uh, you know, that's through Neopoesis Press, which um, is run by Dale Winslow, and, and uh, yeah, I have an association with them as well. Uh, what would you say that general semantics had a role in your satire writing? I would. It certainly has an influence. I mean, it, it actually has an influence in the title of the book. Uh, the title of the book is Lunch with the American People, colon, Satirical Food for Thought. I think that's a clever title. Uh, I'll be narcissistic. Yes. I like the title. Uh, but anyway, um, one of the things that constantly bother, bothered and bothers me is the way politicians and reporters use the phrase the American people. I always get a kick out of that. Uh, sometimes good, sometimes bad. Who are these people? I'm an American. Am I an American people? I'm surely an American person. Where does this group meet? I mean, it's such a high level abstraction, which of course in general semantics, we're taught to question and be skeptical about high level abstractions. What do they really mean? I mean, uh, North Korea builds itself as the North Korea, the Democratic Republic of mm. North Korea. Really, a democratic republic? That's interesting. Let's see how the, demo the democracy works over there. Oh, I guess not. At least not the operational definition that we might think a democracy is. So you always want to uh, think of general semantics and the questioning. You always want to look at the high level abstractions people are using. So certainly uh, the American people is an abstraction politicians use basically to buttress whatever point they're making. Well, the American people feels this way, the American people feels that way. And I immediately think, who are these people? Can I talk to these people and see how they think? And, uh, you know, I'm sure there are some people that support whatever the politician is saying, but there's plenty of people against it. So it's a rhetorical device. And I wanted to just broadly highlight that it's just a rhetorical device, that there is no real American people that these guys are, or women are referring to. So even my first chapter, or my first satire, which was the one that starts the book, Lunch with the American People, the conceit is I invite the American people to sit down with me at a diner. We're going to have lunch together. And I wind up paying for like, you know, 330 million people <laughs> for the lunch. Well, I had such a good time with that. But that's general semantics. Look at these high-level abstractions. Be skeptical when you hear democracy, fairness, justice, American people. See if you can get that person to bring it down a little and say, well, can you give me an example? Or how would you operationally define whatever it is you're talking about? And that's general semantics. And especially Wendell Johnson, who we started off with. Uh, the uh, problem with high-level abstractions is the IFD disease, idealization leading to frustration and demoralization. And the answer is operationalize, come up with operational definitions that are concrete and, and perhaps specify how you, you know, the operations you use to get there. Yeah, that, but from general semantics, that's one of a couple of the formulations really stand out for me in general semantics. One of them is delay your reaction. That has stood me in such good stead in so many instances in relationships. Uh, if, you're, if you're married or if you're, if you're <laughs> steadily seeing someone, uh, 
write that down every night, delay your reaction. Uh, it'll save you a lot of grief and arguments. Uh, but any work, uh, you know, it's so easy to, uh, it's a, at least for me and many others, I suppose, to instinctually want to say something in reaction to what you hear, what you read to others. And um, so often what you instinctually say may be okay, but it's the way you say it and it's the way the other person's going to receive it. I mean, you know, you're with someone else or other people and uh, you need, if you're wanting be effective in getting your message across, you have to also figure out how the receiver is going to take it or try to figure that out. So delaying your reaction to what people are saying and even delaying your reaction to, to events is important. So that's one of the things. The other one is operationally defined things. So often when I'm in a discussion with a person and they're using these abstract terms, I'll simply say, well, that's interesting, but I want to get to know what it is you mean about that. Can you give me some examples about how you use this particular term when you say democracy? Can you give me an example of a democracy you're referring to or how you would define a democracy? So then at least we're on the same page in terms of talking about whatever it is the term is. And, you know, it's not like you're talking about democracy with your own definition in your head. And I'm talking about democracy in my own definition in my head. I think they call it bypassing. Hayakawa mentions this, where we're talking using the same words, but in our head, they're meaning different things. Yeah. So we're getting it out on the table, what it is we mean. We're, we're agreeing on at least the definition of whatever this abstract term is. And it'll, I think it leads to more productive discussions. Yeah, you know, it, I was just looking at some videos uh, on on Facebook, just going through the videos, and uh, there was one about a school board meeting um, where a parent was complaining about DEI, and the person said, "Well, could you tell us what you mean? What you think DEI means? You know, that is diversity, equity, and inclusion. What does that mean?" And of course, the uh, the parent had a great difficulty uh, uh, defining it, it at all. And the only thing she could say is that it's making my kids feel bad about who they are, you know, to which the person and, and, the, and the person was very good about this, you know, was explaining that that's not at all what what DEI is about. And in fact, it's it's just about quite almost the opposite of how um people uh, in minority groups are often made to feel bad about who they are, and this is allowing them to feel feel represented in the same way that members of the majority are. So it's a lesson that stands us in very good stead. I, I don't know if that person had any training in general semantics or just the intuition, but uh, mm -hmm. Often general semantics, as you explained in your own accounting, uh, and it gives you a vocabulary and a kind of way to focus on what we understand to be the right way to approach things. It, it really does. I mean, it's just it's just a shame. I, I feel that general semantics isn't taught. <clears throat> I used to argue this. Uh, I tried to do my bit when I was in the uh, working department of the board department of education. Uh, my small bit to, to, to advance general semantics. I would do, I had a staff at the time uh, who were drug prevention counselors. We would you know, meet once a month and I would do staff trainings using general semantics formulations and explaining how that could help them in their work, counseling students, dealing with parents, dealing with school staff, the public in general. Uh, every, uh, every semester I would, uh, have the district pay for Milton Dawes, who was uh, who's mm. very involved in general semantics. He's in Canada. He would drive down, do a day of training with my staff on general semantics formulations uh, so they could um, use those formulations in their work. And of course, when I did my, my study back in the late 70s using general semantics with the students I was counseling, uh, I part of that study was teaching them general semantics to use uh, in their interactions. Uh, I did a, a study with a control group who didn't have general semantics and the students who learned general semantics, at least according to uh, the statistics that came out of my study, uh, were less alienated from school 
than the students who didn't learn general semantics. So I think uh, if general semantics could somehow be brought into the school system, uh, the kids would benefit, the teachers would benefit, society would benefit, and uh, it's a no-brainer. But, but to get it there, that's the challenge. Yeah. Well, Marty, I was wondering if you would, my, wouldn't mind sharing one of your satires from the book with us, if you would care to read one. Uh, sure. Well, you know, uh, I'll be the first one since I mentioned it, Lunch with the American People. So That would uh, be great. Thank you. Thank you. And that, that one, has, I think, has particular relevance to general semantics. So thank you. So this is uh, the first uh, satire that begins the book. It's called Lunch with the American People. Yesterday, I had lunch with the American people. I had wanted to speak with them for the longest time, as they are a highly influential group of folks, often mentioned by politicians on TV news programs. I met the people in a diner near where I lived. I ordered a BLT sandwich with coleslaw on the side and a cup of coffee. The people ordered cheeseburger specials with double fries and Diet Cokes. I told the waitress to give everyone separate checks. After some idle chit-chat about the huge portions of food typically served in diners, I asked the American people to tell me their thoughts on wearing masks and getting vaccinated to prevent COVID. They started to answer the question before I could finish it, and the cacophony and contempt that individuals within the group had for those who did not share their views was certifiably crazy. Luckily, I had a whistle in my pocket. And after blowing it as loud as I could, the crowd calmed down. It turned out 30% of the people thought mask wearing, taking shots to prevent COVID was a bad idea. 50% thought it was a good idea. 10% said it was a good idea on weekdays, but a bad one on weekends. 7% had no opinion on the matter. And 3% said the pandemic was fake news. I moved on to illegal immigration. Do you think a security fence should be built on the Mexican border? Do you support a guest worker program? Are you in favor of granting amnesty to undocumented individuals currently living in the United States? The people pop right in with answers, which they argued about forcefully with each other, some waving knives and forks in their hands. I worried it might get physical, so after again blowing hard on my whistle, I told everyone to calm down and give a little thought to what they were saying. But I was advised that's not how Americans roll. One guy said, we are a nation. We are not a nation of deliberators. We know what we think and want to express our views quickly so we don't get confused in case someone interrupts us with different ideas. I pleaded with the people to keep their voices low, warning if they didn't, we might be asked to leave. That entreaty worked and was helped by having our food brought out from the kitchen. As the plates were being set down, the people began to argue about who should sit where. I said I didn't think it mattered where anyone sat, and while they were debating the issue, their food was getting cold. No one seemed to care about that, and the squabbly continued, so I took out my trusty whistle, gave it a blow, and said, how about we stop the bickering and just enjoy the meal, to which I was told, Mind your own business and pass the salt. I'd wanted, to, I'd wanted to talk to the people about the economy, race relations, abortion, and a host of other topics, but I didn't have the strength to keep blowing my whistle. That a third of the American people were packing guns also made me wary to talk about anything that was controversial. So I decided to talk about something that was innocuous. Nice weather we're having, I said to my table mates. Meteorology was not the conversational safe harbor I thought it would be. Some of the people said the weather did not look nice to them. Others accused me of being a climate change denier. And a few demanded to know why I was talking about the weather when there were so many other more interesting and important subjects we could talk about. Rather than respond to their remarks, I requested the checks. The checks totaled $2 billion minus the tips. Not a bad price for 330 million cheeseburger specials. The bad part was the only thing everyone agreed on was that I should pay for the food. 
I didn't want to fight such a petulant throng, so I agreed to pick up the tab, which didn't make me happy, as the limit on my credit card is $10,000. I asked the waitress if I could pay with a personal check. She said I could as long as I had three forms of photo ID. Fortunately, I did. As I got into my car to go home, two thoughts struck me. The next time I speak to the American people, I will do it on Twitter, where you don't have to feed folks to get them to talk, and you can be as outlandish, unthinking, and as arbitrary as you like. And after my check bounces, I doubt if I will ever be welcome to eat at this diner again. Wow. And, and of course, that's Twitter prior to Elon Musk. <laughs> yeah. The good old Twitter. <laughs> I guess that's... Uh potential for another satire yeah i did a satire, there's a satire in the book on facebook and that's the one right after this with, with zuckerberg thinking that uh facebook's going to get everybody together and make the world a better place <laughs> <laughs> well i think folks are just going to have to buy the book and read the book so Thank that's you. so that's lunch with the american people satirical food for thought published just recently by Neopoesis Press and available in hard copy only uh, through all major online booksellers. Get yours Correct. as soon as possible. You don't want to miss out. Uh, I think this has been a, a wonderful talk that we've had, Marty, and uh, I want to thank you. That's Martin Levinson. Uh, thank you very much for being our guest on this episode of Semantic Reactions. Well, Lance, thanks for the opportunity, and I want to thank you for all your work doing with these podcasts and all your work doing with the Institute of General Semantics. It's, it's a wonderful organization. I encourage your listeners to become involved with it, join it, and become more involved with General Semantics. So, so thanks again for having me. Great words to end with. Thank you, Marty. You've been listening to our May 2023 episode of Semantic Reactions, featuring an interview with Martin Levinson. If you like what you've heard, or even if you haven't, please consider becoming a member of the Institute of General Semantics, if you're not one already. In addition to supporting our efforts, IGS members receive an annual subscription to our journal, etc., a review of general semantics, access to our online and in-person events, lectures, and seminars, and discounts on the books and audiovisual materials that we sell. Regular membership is only $50, and half off for students. Your membership, and any additional donations you care to make, will help to support our offerings and activities as we work to bring a measure of sanity to the world. The Institute of General Semantics is a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to research and education on a wide range of topics. They include language and symbols, meaning and perception, communication and representation, media and technology, science and epistemology, creativity, and critical thinking. We are dedicated to making the world a better place through practical strategies for improving our semantic environment, individually and collectively. For more information about the Institute and our activities, and to become a member and supporter of our work, please visit our website at generalsemantics.org. That's generalsemantics, one word, dot org. And this brings to a close our ninth episode of Semantic Reactions, the official podcast of the Institute of General Semantics. This is Ben Houck, signing off, saying, we hope you'll join us next time. And until then, just remember this simple fact, that the map is not the territory. <laughs>